Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar. So in today's webinar we are going through TAE and the requirements around TAE and there's a lot of requirements around um, having TAE on your scope and how you can deliver the training and assessing. We'll also be looking at managing transition and teach out. So we, I know there are quite a few qualifications right now that are out there training products uh, that in, are in transition and teach out period. So uh, if you have any questions about today's webinar, please do not hesitate to pop them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, we have online today the Vivacity team. So we've got Amanda, is here, Kirsten, who we can see just the top of the head of, and Kira. <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody. So yeah, we, there we go. We got, got a nice view of your wall. <laughs> uh, Kirsten's had a sore back, so she's having to lie down with those sore backs. So um, thank you for coming along. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. So we've got a few people online. Uh, that we will be going through what are their compliance requirements as per the continuous improvement cycle. Okay, so we have the continuous improvement cycle and for May we're looking at TAE, Managing Transition and Teach Out, and we're also going to have a little look at ELACOS courses um, and the CRICOS requirements 8.6 and 8.7, we'll be going through some of those. So we'll do CRICOS at the end, so if it's not relevant to you, you can jump off at the end. Okay, as per usual, uh, no question is a silly question, so please add your questions because I would love to hear any, see any questions that you may have. Uh, the whole idea about doing this live is so that I can answer your questions directly and be able to have some interaction with your um, with the webinar. So please ask any questions that you may have. Hello, Philippe. Um, also, we uh, this webinar forms part of your professional development and also your continuous improvement under Clause 2.2. Uh, we've been uh, advised that the new standards that will be coming in is clause 2.2 is going to become, and it is now even in the new audit model or assessment, quality assessment model. Um, if you haven't heard, we're not having audits anymore or auditors from ASQA. We're having quality assessors and a quality assessment. So it's just getting used to that language and changing it over. So what they're doing is they're focused on 2.2, which is all around continuous improvement throughout your RTO. So this is really important what we're doing today because it's all about continuous improvement and what you need to do uh, within your organisation. So just attending this webinar is part of your professional development and maintaining your continuous improvement. Review your policies and procedures under standard 2.2 and make sure that you minute that you attended today's meeting and you have a record of what you learnt and what you may need to implement or may need to improve within your policies, procedures and practices. Sounds a bit echoey. Don't know if that's the same for everyone. Oh, okay, I know why. How about now? <laughs> and we'll go there. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so you should also review any documentation that this may relate to. Okay, standards 1.21 to 1.24 is all about RTOs delivering TAE. So that means you have any training products on your scope that may be uh, around TAE, so Cert 4 training and assessment. Uh, also your diploma levels of training and assessment as well. So there are some things that have changed here. So 1.21 uh, is no longer relevant. But in order to deliver any of the TAE training products, you need to make sure that you meet uh, certain requirements. So uh, I'd like to know, is there anybody online today who has TAE on their scope? One, two, or are thinking about putting it on your scope, or no way, not going to touch it. Um, if you can just answer that and pop it in the chat, what, uh, where are you at? Do we have anybody delivering TAE? 
do we have anybody thinking about delivering TA and one we've already got? Never. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty good. No, we'll not add that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty massive. I heard it is way too much of a headache to deal with. Yeah, there's quite a lot uh, of requirements. They made it really tough for people to put it on their scope of registration because there was too many uh, operators out there delivering training and assessment. Uh, what I used to call like it was coming out of a complex packet and it wasn't being delivered properly. So they got really strict. So ASQA got really strict with those RTOs delivering and then uh, the standards uh, adjusted. So to uh, be a bit more strict around the standards. So we'll, because we've got no one, I don't think we've got anybody. So I'll, I'll go over the basics uh, of this so that we can spend more time on transition and teach out. Um, okay, so basically what it means in order for you to be able to deliver TAE, you need to have a trainer assessor. So CERT for training assessment, your trainer assessor must hold a diploma in order to deliver uh, the CERT for in training and assessment. Um, and so uh, when you're working with this to deliver this, they need to hold this, they'll hold the qualifications and they also cannot be working under uh, supervision. There's actually, uh, requirements around it with uh, supervision arrangements where it definitely can't and you can't third party with anybody with TAE so you can't become a third party with TAE uh, they're very very strict with uh, what you can do with uh, TAE on your scope so uh, in this area you need to ensure that you employ uh, experts to teach your trainers and assessors uh, so they need, in order to deliver any AQF qualification or skill set from the training and education package, the RTO must ensure that their trainers and assessors are delivering and have currency as a trainer or assessor um, and also have hold the qualifications. So the relevant uh, uh, credentials for delivering cert for in training and assessment is you need to hold one of these, so that one of the diploma level uh, qualifications. You can also have a higher ed qualification as well um, and it needs to be in adult education if the, if the trainer assessor does hold higher ed qualification. Okay and you must retain evidence of qualifications of trainers and assessors delivering TAE qualifications or skill sets. Now this is across the range with all of your trainers and assessors. You need to make sure that you retain evidence but there will be additional requirements with your trainer or assessor who is delivering cert for training assessment. You need to keep a log of, you know, their um, uh, working as a trainer or assessor, what have they done, what PD are they doing to keep up to date with the training and assessment requirements. Uh, and this is an area where there's going to be, I'm forecasting there's going to be massive changes in the standards that uh, will be coming out later this year. And uh, because there's been a very big focus on when, with the communication and the surveys and the feedback that they were asking for was around trainers and assessors and the qualifications that they hold. So um, also uh, it has been identified that the cert for and training assessment is going to be rewritten uh, from the ground up uh, and there will be no direct equivalent. But don't worry, it's not happening just yet. It's still a while away. Uh, we've, they've still got to get the standards out and got to rewrite um, what the course is. They've been taking feedback from industry and RTOs about trainers and assessors and how could we improve the trainer assessor skill set. So that has been a very big focus. And one of the things that I've identified that could possibly change is a professional development point type of uh, register for a register for identifying that trainers are keeping up to date with their professional development. Also a register of all the trainers and assessors. So these are things I'm hypothesizing may happen with the new standards. And also uh, looking at what is professional development, what is currency. Now this last month, ASQA did a spotlight on series on trainers and assessors. So uh, it was all recorded and it's all available on the ASCO website. So if you missed it, you can go onto the ASCO website and go check that out. 
highly recommend that you share that with the your other trainers and assessors and colleagues that you work with uh, because there's some really good information there about professional development and maintaining your currency within your industry. So I'd recommend that you get onto that. Spotlight On series uh, for this month is online learning. So it'll be uh, very interesting. There's, uh, they've actually got a um, couple of workshops and things that are going to be on as well uh, online. So uh, industry skills and knowledge. So while the standards do not prescribe how trainers and assessors must maintain their currency, it is the responsibility of the RTO to retain evidence. And this big part here is current industry skills and knowledge of your trainers and assessors and that their skills and knowledge are directly related to the training and assessment that they're delivering, which can be very difficult if you're delivering Cert 4 and training and assessment. You need to make sure that you focus on your professional development in uh, the VET sector. Uh, it'll also be around compliance, training and assessment strategies and delivery methods as well. Okay, so industry skills and knowledge with TAE, it's more around that um, industry knowledge around the vet sector. So it's keeping current with those, doing uh, workshops like these, um, and also uh, keeping your uh, skills up to date with your training and assessing. If you have TAE on your scope or you wish to place TAE on your scope, all of the training products, so the training and assessment tools, for uh, every single unit on your uh, training and assessment, as well as five other qualifications on your scope of registration need to be independently validated in order for you to do an addition to scope. And that independent validation is ensuring, okay, if you're delivering training, cert for and training assessment, how are you going with your compliance with the other qualifications that you're delivering? Are you collecting sufficient evidence? Are you uh, meeting the rules of evidence and principles assessment, and how are you conducting that training, and the big part is sufficient evidence that you're collecting. So in order for you to put, place it on your scope, you need to have uh, an independent validation, which is validation conducted by someone who's independent of your RTO. Now we can't do independent validation for any of our clients because we already work with them. It would only be with a new client that we could do independent validation with. So, uh, so that's the type of work that you, uh, what you need to do. Now, however, we do have a consultant that we work with that uh, can be independent uh, and do the validation for you uh, and they're not underneath uh, Vivacity. So there is, we have strategies there for assisting our clients. Okay, so what does it mean? Uh, is it, independent validation. It means you're not involved in the validation at all. Um, it would be the end of independent party. So with Vivacity, we would validate the uh, training and assessment tools for each unit for the Cert 4 and training and assessment. We would also validate up to five other qualifications. Um, and it's making sure that you are able to demonstrate that you can deliver your training and assessment that is compliant and meeting the requirements. It's also ensuring that we have better quality trainers and assessors out there who actually have the skills and knowledge required to be able to deliver training and assessment. And it's a really core skill uh, that our client trainers need to have in order to be able to deliver um, effectively. So it's a big process for adding TAE onto your scope. Uh, you will, as with your addition to scope uh, application, you need to submit uh, a number of documents. So first of all, you've got to do a um, external independent validation of your assessments. Um, and it's up to five other training products that are on your scope. And it's every single unit of those other five training products. So it's quite a bit of work um, involved. And what's really important is you want to have little to no non-compliances with those assessment tools um, because you want to make sure that they're actually going to be uh, valid and uh, are going to meet the requirements. Otherwise, you your application for addition to scope will get knocked back. So the assessment system your RTO will adopt for the training products being applied. So what will you be doing with your Cert 4 training assessment? It's looking at your training and assessment strategy, your delivery and assessment plan, and your assessment tools for the qualification that you're placing on your scope. 
uh, be insert portraying assessment. Uh, and one big thing with uh, TAE, your RTO has to have done two full cycles, ran for two full years before you can apply to place TAE on your scope. So it needs to be two or more years old before you can place TAE. And that's just keeping those uh, requirements around making sure that we've got good quality training. Okay. That's it for TAE. Have we got any questions around TAE? Questions, thoughts, chatter? Um, if you have any, you can pop in the chat. Otherwise, we're going to move on to transition and teach out. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like no questions. All right, we'll get on to transition and teach out. Who online today? has a training product on their scope that is going through transition and teach out right now. So it's been superseded. If you have, can you just pop it in the chat and what it is currently preparing for CHC transition? Yep, excellent. Okay, we've got CHC. Anybody with the BSBs? Yes, Anne's got BSB, yep. Uh, uh, if you could just put the training package that you're, just so I can make it more relevant for you. So we've got CHC, I know there's some BSBs, first aid, yep. First aid's another area. Um, we just had an update to 11, I think it is. So apply first aid, yep. Uh, BSB and ICT, yep. Okay, excellent. Uh, so a few transition and teach out. And there's quite a bit uh, going around at the moment. Okay, uh, okay, you've got very specific. <laughs> That's a seafood one I, I can see. Um, and BSB and ICT. Yep, excellent. Okay, all right, cool. Social media marketing. So social media marketing, if you've got the diploma of social media marketing on your scope, they just had a um, the accredited course renewed and there's a new training product uh, that's just come out. Um, we've actually worked with Social Media College on uh, the accredited course. And we also wrote their latest RPL kit. So I'm very proud to say that we were uh, part of the team helping them with that. So um, you should be happy with the tools. <laughs> um, I've also been doing some validation of their tools as well. So we've got some BSBs as well. Excellent. Okay. All right. So um, if you've got any questions specifically around those, please don't hesitate to ask. I know um, we've got Amanda um, online today and she has been involved with a few uh, transitions uh, with some of our clients. So if you've got any questions, we can work on those. Okay. And so, you, Anne, you've just got single units then that have just uh, uh, been superseded. So we're looking at single units as well as the full qualification. Okay. All right. Cool. So basically the standards around transition of training products is making sure that as an RTO, that you're able to either uh, teach out the student, so get them completed in their current uh, quali uh, qualification or training product that they're in, or teach uh, or transition. So the transition is if it's going to take a while, um, depending on where they're at with the course um, and how long it is, is how you're going to ensure that they transition over to the new qualification. But it's also looking at you as an RTO. What is your process? What are you doing within your RTO for this transition and um, teach out? Do you have strategies in place for that transition and teach out? For our uh, consult members, you would have access to all of our policies, procedures, forms and documentation. Check out the policies and procedures around this because we've actually got strategies in there about what you should do for transition and teach out. So uh, make sure that you have a look at that. But it's really making sure that you're not delivering training products that are superseded on your scope. So when it's superseded on your scope, you'll no longer see it on training.gov.au. So when you go on to TGA, you can see your scope of registration. Um, if it's been superseded, it will no longer be on your scope. The transition part is where you can, you normally have 12 months. I know BSB was 18 months. They gave 18 months for BSB. Um, and some have a bit longer. Um, the, the standard is 12 months where you've got to do uh, transition. 
So you need to put a plan in place for what is your process going to be to transition over. So you've got a new training product. Um, and one of the things that I would recommend is transition over as soon as possible. It might be finishing off the students that you currently have and then enroll students into the new uh, training product. Um, or it could be looking at that uh, transitioning them over depending on how far off they are from completing the units. So when you're looking at transitioning of the training products, you need to, um, but basically what it is, is really looking at what that whole process is for you've got uh, your uh, existing training product and the new training product. It's validating your old assessment tools to the old unit against the new unit to make sure that you're collecting sufficient evidence against the new unit. So that's one of the first things that you need to do is make sure that you're updating your assessment tools. Um, and, and the only thing before that it, you would do is put a plan in place for that transition and teach out period. What are you going to do? When are you going to plan on transitioning? Uh, what is going to be your cutoff date? And when are you going to enroll new students into the new training product? So you should put together a strategy document for that, or you could also minute it at your monthly meeting of what the, that process is going to be. So you really need to start with that, put the plan in place, but the big part is identifying and looking at your existing assessment tools against the new units of competencies the new training product requirements and make sure that you're collecting sufficient evidence. Now there's some uh, really good things that you can do where and I actually covered this in training products in the last masterclass uh, where you can go on to training.gov.au and you can compare to training products so you can compare the superseded training product against the new training product and it will tell you what the gaps are, what the differences are um, and it's a really good way to be able to identify okay what's the additional training that we need to provide or what do we need to have in our assessment tools uh, to meet the new requirements of the training product. So you need to ensure that you've got a really clear and transparent process for what you're going to do. The, one of the big things is rewriting your training and assessment strategy and it's where you should start is by going to the training and assessment strategy and identifying what needs to be updated on the TAS. You should also at this time undertake new industry consultation and surveys and get feedback that you can include into your training and assessment strategy. More often than not, we see RTOs, what they do is they just dive in and uh, change the assessment tools and change the delivery, but they don't update the TAS and they don't update the DAP. The big thing is with the TAS and the DAP is it's your core documentation that you should be using for that transition and teach out period because it's where we identify, okay, this is what we had, this is where we're going, these are the changes we're going to make um, and how are you going to implement that within your RTO. You also need to incorporate uh, your industry consultation and the feedback that you've received about how you can improve your training practices based on those changes that have happened within the training product. The other key really important area is your staff matrix. Your trainers and assessors will need to map their skills and knowledge from the, pre the superseded training product to the new training product. So either they hold the direct equivalent unit, which would be very hard if it's just come out, um, it would be mapping their skills and knowledge across to the new unit of competency. Um, Amanda's very kindly shared a link on the list uh, on the chat a full list of training products with extended transition period is available on the ASCO website so she's got the link there to the ASCO website they also ASCO also will do updates um, they will be on training.gov.au but they'll also go on the ASCO website when they are extending the transition period so you can uh, check that out okay now, what can be really tricky is making sure new students are not enrolled into old uh, training products. Um, and it's looking at, or, and in particular, that have been removed or deleted, so they're superseded from your scope of registration. You cannot enroll a student into a training product that's no longer on your scope on TGA. So you need to make sure that you're receiving updates from TGA about what is currently on your scope, 
Um, and when it comes to uh, accredited courses, sometimes they can just disappear like that. So they're just gone off your scope and that means you're no longer able to deliver it. So you need to make sure that you're receiving updates on training.gov.au uh, to notify you of any changes to training products on your scope. And I would register to get updates about your RTO um, on TGA. Okay, so this is the procedure that we have in the policies and procedures uh, that you can access on Unicorn. Um, so this is the transition process. So first of all is review and map. So it's reviewing and mapping the old unit of competency or training product against the new training product. And what are the changes? Is it a major change? Is it a minor change? How is it going to impact you and your students? And how long do you think that process will be for the changeover for the training product? Um, review all your training and assessment systems, tools and processes and, and map it to the new training product. And this includes your training and assessment strategy, your delivery and assessment plan and your staff matrices. So you need to make sure that they're all updated to meet the requirements of the new training product. Then make the necessary change to the training and assessment tools in consultation with training and assessment staff. So you should be looking, going to your trainers and assessors and asking them about uh, getting feedback on what these changes are. Um, and also making sure that you're validating uh, those changes of, from the old training product to the new training product. So in particular, if you're gonna be rewriting your assessment tool to the new training product, what are you going to do um, to ensure that it's going to be valid and reliable and flexible and relevant and fair, um, meeting the rules of evidence and principles assessment. Um, we also have a, uh, last month we did a assessment validation workshop. Uh, you can access that online on Vivacity Training, uh, where we have a recording of those. Uh, we've broken up the one day workshops into two half day sessions now. Um, so to help help with Zoom fatigue for both you and I. Um, and so we've broken it up into two half days and it worked really well uh, last month. So on the Vivacity calendar, you'll see that there is, um, we've got the dates for the upcoming workshops. The next one is on CRICOS. I don't know whether we're gonna have very much for CRICOS since there isn't a lot of people delivering CRICOS at the moment. So we'll see how we go with registrations for that. Um, but we will be doing a workshop on CRICOS and all of the national code and go through all of that. So even if you're thinking about putting CRICOS on your scope, um, attending that workshop is a very good idea for you to do. Okay, uh, update. Update the training and assessment strategy to meet the requirements of the new training product as per the policies and procedures. So we've got it um, in the manual. Um, and I don't know whether these page numbers are actually correct. So uh, just go look uh, by the clause because they're all correct by the clause. Complete, complete a change of scope application using Asquanet. Um, if the training product is not a direct equivalent, you may have to add the uh, new training product onto your scope of registration. You can uh, check it out on training.gov.au. What are the requirements? Um, what happens is if it's not a direct equivalent and you're not eligible to just have it added to your scope straight away, um, you'll see it when it's been superseded that the new one isn't on your scope yet. So it, it, there's different ways that they'll do it. If there's a major change to the training product, uh, you'll need to do a addition to scope. Um, if it's a minor change, you'll just get the new one uh, placed onto your scope. So uh, you'll need to have a look at those process. Um, and you can also see that link that Amanda's provided there about transition and extension. Okay, so you should also schedule your courses with the new training product in the future. So this should be part of your plan. So you've got 12 months for transition and teach out. So you could start your new courses in 12 months or you could start it before then. So depending on when you're going to have your new intake um, and you've must make sure that you have it on your scope of registration. So if it's a, the direct equivalent that's come onto your scope, then you're fine. Um, you can start marketing that. If it's not a direct equivalent and you need to do an addition of scope, you have to wait for the addition of scope to be added on TGA before you can start marketing. You can't market anything 
with the new code and title of the training product unless it's on your scope of registration. So please make sure that you check first uh, that on TGA that you have the current training product on your scope because you actually will be breaking the legislation if you do start marketing a training product that is not on your scope of registration. So please make sure that you check that out. If you are going through transition at the moment, make sure you've got the new one on your scope before you do anything. You can't even say we will be delivering because you don't know. With an additional scope, you need to have it on your scope first before you can start marketing. Um, you should also really look at your training materials. Does that need to be updated? It could be equipment. You need to add additional equipment uh, because the training product now requires simulation in that equipment. Uh, there could be a range of different changes that would affect the way you're delivering your training and assessment. So make sure you've got all of the materials and all of the training products that you need um, and resources that you need in order to be able to deliver that new training product on your scope. You need to make sure that you do a full review of all of your marketing materials. And the big thing is your website. Make sure your website's updated um, and uh, that it reflects the changes of the training product that you're now delivering on your scope of registration. Make sure you've got the correct code and title. Um, and just a reminder, make sure when you use the NRT logo, it's only used next to the code and title of the training product. Um, we're still seeing, not with that necessarily with our clients, but we're still seeing a lot where the NRT logo is in the header or the footer of the website. So it's on every single page and it's not next to the code and title or the training product. That goes with the AQF logo as well. So if you're delivering full qualifications, it has to be next to the code and title. You can't just have it anywhere willy-nilly on your website. It's got to be next to the code and title. So it's got to be really clear what is um, the accredited course. So I just thought I'd add that when you're a good time to review. Uh, TAS is updated and disseminated to all relevant staff. So uh, all the trainers and assessors who deliver that training product should get a copy of the updated training and assessment strategy so that they know what your strategy is for the delivery of your training and assessment. You should also uh, make sure that you put in place a uh, validation uh, system of validating post-assessment validation of the new training uh, and assessment tools that you are using so that you have uh, making sure that you've got your continuous improvement there. And the highest risk units would be the units that have had the most change. So the most changes within the unit of competency. So review the process to be undertaken during the 12 month transition period. Uh, the CEO should review the status and progress of existing participants because as a CEO, you're responsible for the compliance requirements to determine which participants can complete their studies during the transition. So you need to also decide when do we do a transition and when and who are the students that will do teach out. So you need to identify that. Um, you may even find that you get some students who would prefer to have the new training product. So it might be looking at you know, deferring them or moving them on to the new training product. So you need to have some sort of system in place for that. Complete and issue all certification uh, within a year of the training product being superseded. So what that means, if you've got a student at the end of the 12 months who hasn't completed all the units, you must issue a statement of attainment for all the units they have completed. And then you can use that for RPL or credit transfer or um, looking at how you can collect gaps for the additional units that they need to complete. So a really good process for transition and teach out is move the units around and change anyone, any of the units that are gonna be superseded, move them to get completed earlier. Uh, so that way, because uh, if it's going to be superseded, you're not gonna be able to deliver, um, you're not gonna be able to deliver that. Um, or the other way is get the units that are the direct equivalents, do the direct equivalents, um, and then you can do a credit transfer. So it just depending on where that period is for transition and teach out. So you need to really identify where your students are at. Okay, if learners have not completed within 12 months, you'll need to issue a statement of attainment for all of the units that they have completed. Uh, and um, and have been issued a certificate within two years of the qualification being removed or deleted 
uh, from your scope. Learners have been issued with a certification with one year of skill sets, units, modules, or short courses being removed or deleted. Uh, the CEO is required to advise all current participants, including employers, if relevant, about the revised units and the change of training product uh, that is going on to their scope. Uh, in particular, if you're doing a transition, you need to have, uh, have your students involved with that transition process and how are you going to keep up to keep them up to date. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is get your students completed as soon as possible. So get them through uh, the training product so that you can get on to the new one. If it's not possible, make sure you've got that teacher process in there. So uh, this is just an example of a transition and teach out. So the student is enrolled, three months uh, training has uh, been completed and the training product has been superseded. So you have 12 months from, so this is one year, but you have 12 months from that date that you need to transition. So must transition to new training product or completed training. Now you may have students who are lagging behind, um, they might be doing self-paced or online, um, or they uh, drop out and need to come back in. You need, if they withdraw, you need to do a statement of attainment from where they completed, which includes all the units that they've completed, um, or if you get to the end of that uh, superseded training product stage, then a statement of attainment, and then work out how you're going to transition them over and complete the training. Equivalent and not equivalent changes. Equivalent changes. When a new or revised training product is released, ASQA identifies all the qualifications and units of competencies classified as equivalent to a current training product. If you have one of these products on your scope of registration, you'll need to update your scope with the new equivalent training product onto your scope. Um, ASQA can also apply any sanctions or conditions that apply to the superseded product on your scope to the new uh, and equivalent product. Apply the same scope extent listed on the National Register to the new equivalent uh, product, deliver and assess or deliver only. So you need to have a look at what your delivery methods will be uh, for the uh, superseded and then moving to the new. Inform you, uh, so ASQ will inform you via email that uh, we, they've updated your scope, including the details. So if it's a direct equivalent, you'll get an email stating that the, it's been updated. So you've got the new training product on your scope. So non-equivalent. So the new training product is not equivalent. When an SSO's uh, revision of a training package does, a uh, product changes its outcome from the new version, it becomes non-equivalent and to the superseded training product. So ASQA considers not equivalent products uh, to, uh, to the new products. As for any new product, ASQA undertakes a risk assessment before approving adding them to your scope of registration and making sure that you have, uh, you have sufficient uh, uh, systems and practices in place to be able to deliver the new training product. You can add a, a not equivalent training product to your scope in the same way you would do add a new training product to your scope. Uh, to do this, you can do it through Asquanet and you'll need to make sure that you've got a training and assessment strategy in place, a delivery and assessment plan and a staff matrix. You don't need to submit these with your application depending on how long you have been running as an RTO. If you've been running operating for more than two years, it's just a matter of doing the addition of scope through Asquanet and then uh, you can add it and you don't need to provide any evidence. But be warned, We've had a client recently who did an addition to scope and they ended up going through a quality assessment. So the new audit process. So just because it, they make it easy and you can just submit it through Asquanet does not mean that you'll avoid an assessment um, because that is their process. And if they identify that what you're putting on your scope is high risk, they may want to come in and inspect your premises or uh, conduct an assessment to ensure that you have suffi sufficient facilities, trainers, and your training and assessment strategies are in place to be able to deliver that training. So we would not recommend doing an addition of scope and submitting without getting those three core documents ready first. Training and assessment strategy, delivery and assessment plan, and your staff matrix. You also need to make sure you've got all of your assessment tools in place 
and that you have all of the equipment required to be able to deliver that training. Because when you submit your addition to scope, you actually sign a document that states that you have everything in place. So if you don't have everything in place, you've actually broken the law because you signed a document or the CEO did to say that everything is in place. So uh, I have seen people who do this, they just do an addition scope, they haven't got everything in place. And then uh, ASQA get in contact with them and say, okay, we're gonna do an assessment of you now. Uh, now you need to run around frantically to make sure you have all of those documents in place. So do not recommend that you do that. Make sure that you have all your documents ready first before you submit. Um, the new requirements with the ASQA quality assessment is making you accountable as an RTO to ensure that you have everything in place. They're going to also be providing education on this, but they're going to rely on you to have a continuous improvement approach throughout your organisation and how have you got that quality compliance managed within your RTO and what the processes are there. So make sure that you have it all in place. Do not do an addition of scope without everything in place uh, because you could be the one where they do a surprise audit and you've only got like two weeks to get ready, to get everything ready. And you cannot write a TAS and a DAP and a staff matrix in two weeks. There's a lot of work to do in that time frame. Okay, transition obligations. The standards require RTOs to manage their scope of registration. So making sure that you have uh, the current training products on your scope and that you're only delivering what's on your scope of registration. So this includes transitioning uh, to any revised equivalent uh, training packages and the transition must occur within that 12 month period. You may continue to deliver a superseded training product as long as it's still on your scope of registration on training.gov.au. And you should put in place strategies for transition and teach out. It is a requirement of the standards that you have a process there for that transition and teach out. During transition, both training products will remain on your scope. Um, if ASQA conduct an audit during this time, the auditor will check that you have implemented a strategy for transition and teach out, and you have to have a uh, training and assessment strategy for the superseded training product and the new training product, particularly if you're still delivering it. So if you're not delivering anymore and you're fully transitioned over to the new training product, take the old one off and that way you're not um, liable for anything that's happening with the old training product because otherwise you've got to keep both of them up to date uh, with your trainers and assessors and uh, assessment tools and all that sort of stuff. Okay, staying informed about changes, highly recommend you go on to training.gov.au. I have covered this in the assessment validation course. I've uh, also, uh, I think I've got a unit in the membership about registering on TGA. Um, so sign up to the National Register for any updates for your training packages, um, but also your RTO. So make sure that you're keeping up to date and that you're being notified of any changes. So that way you know when transition in Teach Out is happening um, and that you're uh, up to speed with it. So transition uh, preparation, review the revised training package, assess any requirements, examine your RTO's resources and revise your TAS. That's it in a nutshell of what you need to do. Uh, okay, question. Transition to updated qualifications can be held up by the state training authorities being slow to approve the updated qualifications for training contracts. Correct, correct. Um, often the state training authorities are way behind. I uh, think I, had explained uh, this once before, but when I had my RTO, uh, I had been approved for a training contract with State Training Authority. The training package changed, we'd updated everything uh, within the RTO, but uh, State Training Authority couldn't do it. So every time I submitted a report for government funding, I had to change the codes just for them just so I could claim the money. And for some reason they could not, we have to transition and teach out, but apparently state training authority don't. <laughs> so we need to make sure that um, we're keeping up to date and you wanna claim your money. So we wanna make sure it's there. So just be careful, make sure if you do have a training product that's superseded, 
that you get in contact with State Training Authority and notify them of the change of training product. Just because they're a government department doesn't mean that they know that a training product has been superseded. So you need to keep on top of them as well um, and find out what the process is for transitioning over. And I think Amanda's got a question. Come on down. Additionally, you should write to ASQA and apply for an extended transition period for those qualifications. That'll give state training a chance to catch up. Yeah. So if you do have state training authority funding, um, yeah, that's a really good idea. Go to state training authority and uh, no, go to ASQA and ask for an extension. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So uh, any other questions? questions there we're almost at the end of this one so non-current training products um, ssos may remove a training product uh, at any time if you're offering a training product that is no longer on your scope you must within two years of removal complete all training assessment and issue the qualifications um, you'll have one year from the removal to complete all training assessment and issue statements of attainment Uh, extended transition period. So ASQA may extend this transition period. Um, as you can see, we've got that link about uh, training products that have been um, extended. Um, and you can also request for an extension, particularly if you're having issues with, um, so if you're funded under the old training product, you don't want it removed off your scope until you've got all your funding uh, completed because so it, uh, State Training Authority won't change it over. Um, you need to make sure that you've still got it on your scope whilst you've still got that contract um, and you can apply for that um, extension. Okay, so that's it for RTO. Any questions? Any questions? If you have any, you can pop it in the chat. Um, otherwise, we're going to do a review of the CRICOS requirements. If you are not interested, <laughs> don't want to know, um, you're not doing CRICOS, uh, you can leave, uh, that's fine. Um, and I'll do a review of CRICOS for those that are in interested. We're looking at ELACOS. So what are the requirements around ELACOS courses? So that's English courses. Um, so if you want to stay on, we can uh, go through those. Otherwise, I'll see you next month. Um, if you are a VIP or a course uh, consult membership, make sure you get onto the masterminds every Monday. They're great masterminds. We also have a masterclass next week for the eight critical drivers on Wednesday, the 12th of May. So join us for that uh, masterclass, which is going to be on leadership management and team. So it's looking at your leadership skills um, and team management. Uh, so all members get access to the masterclass, which is next Wednesday. Um, and you've all been, they've already been invited, Kira. Also on the Facebook group, you can access on the Facebook group. I might get you to pop them into the Facebook group uh, there because all our members should be going on there. Um, I do also other updates on there. So you can go into the Facebook group and there's lots of other updates that are in there um, and you can join there. All right, who, who, thanks everyone, awesome. Who will be sticking around? Just, uh, if you can just put a yes in the chat. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Yes, Amanda. <laughs> Tanya, good. Okay, and we'll see you next week. That's it. And I say, we just got Tanya. We've got a couple of people who may not be listening to everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to go through a quick review of Elacos courses. So who here has Krikos and Elacos on their scope? Currently delivering Alacost courses. No one? <laughs> Two. That's not in my chat. They must have sent it just to you, man. <laughs> uh, Tanya, me. Uh, Nicole's got Krakos. Okay. 
All right, cool. All right. So if I'm just trying to figure out what you know about Elacos. So Elacos is where you can deliver English language courses. And there's a lot of requirements. Like you've got to have a curriculum in place. There's got um, requirements around, you know, the standards and making sure that you are, you know, delivering uh, the training that meets the, the requirements. So within the standards, it says that you need to make sure that you're achieving satisfactory attendance for the course. So which is at a minimum must be 80% of the course. So there's attendance monitoring that is required around um, Elacos students. So if you have Elacos students in your training, you need to make sure that you're monitoring their attendance. Um, and some states or territories may even have higher hours. The method of working out minimum attendance under the standards, so looking at that. Processing for recording course attendance, so you need to have a process in place for how are you managing your course attendance. So that could be by a card that they scan, it could be a sign-in sheet, it could be, um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of some other things that they could do. You might have, um, I have seen fingerprint ones and I have seen eye scan, not very many of the eye scans, but you can have the eye scan one as well. Okay, uh, details of the registers provide as intervention strategy. So having an intervention strategy in place for those overseas students who may fall behind with their attendance requirement and the processes for determining the point at which the overseas student has failed to meet this requirement satisfactorily. Okay, the registered provider must have and implement a documented policy and procedure. So for all of our CRICOS clients on Unicorn, the course uh, consult members, you'll have access to uh, Vivacity's policies and procedures and documentation. Um, and we have a whole process. It's actually quite uh, involved with this monitoring uh, requirement and making sure that the students are achieving satisfactory course progress. Now, if you are an Elacos provider, you'll need to add additional things to your policies and procedures that are in line with the curriculum that you're delivering so that you're ensuring that your policies and procedures align with the curriculum. Um, and what we recommend is wh whomever you develop the curriculum with, that you get them involved with the policies and procedures and updating the policies and procedures for that curriculum uh, because it's different for different curriculum depending on uh, what you're putting into place. Okay, uh, so uh, there are a number of requirements are under the Elacos standards that you need to make sure that you're adhering to. So it's making sure that you're meeting the learner cohort needs, um, because they come from a non-English speaking background, it's all those support services that you need to have in place and make sure that your training is going to meet the requirements of the different learner cohorts that you have within your training. So if you have different cultures within your training, you need to, and different languages, um, you're going to need to look at how are you going to manage them as a whole uh, within your training. Um, we're also going to be looking at the contact hours, if you have students under 18, uh, teaching assessment resources, staff premises and business management. So it's just a quick snapshot. So as a minimum, the students must be attending 20 hours per week of face-to-face -face training. Um, any online is in addition to the 20 hours. So uh, in particular for Elacost, you need to make sure you've got additional, it's additional training. So you can do online, but it's got to be additional. Um, usually five days per week, sometimes four evenly spread. So it just depends on how you're doing your timetable. Um, and you, know, you, you may have optional other activities. It could be uh, where you're helping them to find a job um, and job seeking skills, or it could be um, using English language in a Australian environment. It might be taking them out to restaurants and things like that. So there's lots of other optional activities that you can add that is not included in those 20 hours. Under 18s, ideally separated from adults. So if you have any students under the age of 18, unless they're like 17 turning 18. Um, I know a lot of the providers that we work with, they uh, prefer not to uh, use the uh, deliver to under 18s. So uh, it's more so for the um, more for vocational education. 
Uh, usually the courses are, are tailored to their age, um, in particular if they're at school, it might be preparing them for high school. Um, and it's very high level duty of care. So anybody who's got any under 18s, they would know what it's a lot more work and the government are a lot more stringent with the requirements with how are you looking after those students. Teaching, so you need to have a placement test when you're doing uh, English LACOS courses because you need to really identify what are their skills and knowledge like, what is their language skills like before they come in and are they going to be successful to do this training um, for that placement and getting into your training. You can have a maximum of 18 students per trainer and the teaching language can be very complex. So there's an emphasis on making sure that you have plenty of time for all of the students. Uh, and pre-COVID, it was 1.5 metres square per student. Um, I'm not sure what the requirements are now. I think we've gone back to two metres square now. Um, assessment. So with assessments for LACOS courses, you need, and this is where you need a curriculum developer uh, to be working with this. So you need to make sure that you're working against the criteria for the learning outcomes. Um, there is much less emphasis on assessment than it is with the vocational education and training. So it's more around their speaking skills and their writing skills uh, and English language. Measuring language proficiency is very tricky and you need to be very careful with how you're doing that. That's why I recommend getting a professional curriculum developer uh, for your LACOS courses. So there are a range of resources that you should have in place. There's lots of books that you can access as well. Um, and there's also audio, audio is really, really good for them to work on. That can be online stuff that they do. And there will be independent study that they'll be required to do because you want to get them to practice the English language skills as much as possible. You will need to ensure that you have specialist staff. So they have a degree uh, plus TESOL qualification. Um, and with new teachers, make sure that you've got mentoring happening. Um, you also need to ensure that you've got an academic manager in place so as teachers plus uh, post-grad TESOL plus appropriate management and LACOS teaching experience. So there's a lot more requirements around your trainers and assessors and what they need to have in place for qualifications, experience, and they may need to be under a mentoring program. Um, they should also be keeping up to date with their professional development. Uh, and be very aware of the welfare and academic requirements for assisting the students and support services, providing those support services for the students. Your premises will need to be 9B approved um, and basically that will be council zoning or secure tenure um, and you need to make sure that you have a look at that and that's changing in a few places with that as well. What about for newer courses where there may not be a degree program available yet? blockchain. Um, you can't have international students for blockchain. You could do, if you did an LACOS course, you could have it as an additional course. It couldn't meet, it couldn't be in part of the 20 hour requirement. Um, yeah, because it's very strict around CRICOS that you must, you must either have or LACOS and or VET qualifications and or higher ed qualifications that you're delivering. They can do, um, you've got to be very careful around non-accredited training uh, and who are they going to. As the provider, you're responsible for looking after the students. And if you are the primary provider, you're the one that needs to look after the welfare of the students. So what I mean by primary provider is you may be providing the LACOS training, but they also are doing higher ed at a university or they might be going to another um, RTO for their vocational education training. So if you are the pr primary provider, you'll be the one responsible for welfare whilst they're in Australia and it just depends on what you're doing. But non-accredited, mm, not sure. I don't know whether Amanda's got anything to say about that. She might be looking it up. <laughs> I know yep. we've had issues with this before. Yep, so there's, we've, we've got two in the VET sector, two qualifications that relate to blockchain, a 
um, an accredited diploma and accredited advanced diploma. Um, and some universities have it incorporated as part of a degree. So there's definitely training there yeah. that relates there to go. life training. There you go. Training. We, we could be, we are doing the advanced diploma. Uh, we could be learning about blockchain soon, Amanda. <laughs> that would be interesting. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'll move on with the premises. Uh, so the big thing is making sure uh, that you're looking after the safety of the students whilst they're in your building. So there will be um, additional safety requirements that you need to look at the building. Um, I know even with RTOs, they're picking up things like carpet, torn, holes in walls, air conditioning. We had a client who didn't have air conditioning and uh, they, that actually came up in an audit report. I don't know what it's going to be like in the new ones, but it's really looking at how are you ensuring the safety and looking after the students, maintaining privacy and confidentiality. And how are you assisting them through transition to living in Australia? Um, and what are you doing to support those students whilst they're living in Australia? There you go. Amanda's just popped a link in there about blockchain. We're all going to learn about blockchain now. <laughs> okay, business management. So you need to make sure that you have all your insurances in place. So that includes your professional indemnity, public liability, but it's also making sure that you're meeting the requirements uh, for safety, WHS, um, and that you have uh, mechanisms in place for looking after your students. Um, uh, NIAS, uh, if you are a CRICOS provider, you should be looking at NIAS. Uh, so NIAS actually provides a whole heap of, if, as a member of NIAS, they provide uh, all sorts of systems and practices that can help you with ELACOS, so in particular with ELACOS courses. Policies and procedures. So in the uh, CRICOS uh, policies and procedures manual that we have, the Q&C manual, uh, we include that reporting process so with breaches, uh, attendance requirements, intervention plans and things like that. Highly recommend you go in and have a look at those. Uh, because it's really important that you are reporting any breaches um, and making sure prisons is kept up to date. You don't want to be one of those providers that gets caught out where a student's gone missing. Uh, you need to know where your students are at, at any given time. I heard recently on the news that uh, we've got international students coming back in for uh, university level at least anyway. So I'll be interested to see how we go by the end of the year. Um, they're being strict from which country they're coming from um, and then looking at um, isolation requirements prior to commencing any study. So if you do have international students, you should be looking at your planning for July, mid-year intake and what that process would be. Um, but then problem is it's so up in the air, you might find that the students don't want to come because it is so up in the air. Um, hopefully we'll get this resolved as soon as possible and be able to bring people back into Australia. Um, so when not to report, there are limited circumstances where a provider may decide not to report an overseas student for falling below 80% uh, attendance. So the Elacost provider, the overseas student is still attending at least 70% and you can see that they're still progressing through their course um, and it might be that they've provided genuine, compassionate or compelling circumstances. Uh, for the reason why they've fallen below. It might be they are still working, but they're working from home uh, because they've had an accident or have been ill or something like that. So it's up to you whether you want to report um, if it's 70% or above. If they fall below 70%, then Sorry, you need to report, you. then you need to report that. Uh, for vet providers who are required to monitor attendance by the ESOS agency, the overseas student is still attending at least 70% of the scheduled course and contact hours and is maintaining satisfactory course progress. Um, you may be required to extend course duration and this is normally under compassionate and compelling reasons that that may uh, be required. Um, you can only extend the overseas student uh, enrollment if the registered provider has assessed that there are compassionate or compelling reasons. Um, you've also implemented an intervention strategy plan 
we have that in the policies and procedures and we also have an intervention plan document uh, that you can use as well. Uh, where And the big thing here is making sure that you're working with the student for a plan for them to attend training and complete their training um, and making sure that they're going through that training and minimising the risk. Um, big thing is, is you want to make sure that you're supporting the students throughout their training. An approved deferral or suspension of the overseas students' enrolment um, has occurred. So if the provider extends the duration of an overseas student um, enrolment, you need to make sure that you're letting border protection, uh, informing border protection, uh, and that you're meeting the requirements of border protection control. There are a range of different reasons why there would be compassionate and compelling reasons. We've had a lot with the um, with uh, COVID in the last year. Uh, there are lots of reasons why people, uh, they may have had to go back home. Uh, there are now people who can't get back to Australia because they've gone back home. Uh, so that's uh, some of the reasons it can be. Uh, I know that we've had a number of cases with international students where they've gone home because a family member's died um, and then they can't get back into Australia. So, um, and that's getting access to the death certificate. And what are you gonna do to manage that? How are you gonna bring them back into Australia? Um, so there's lots of requirements uh, that you need to cover, but these are all the areas that can be considered compassionate and compelling. Online learning, you've gotta be really careful with online learning, um, particularly with Elacos. Uh, it needs to be additional to the 20 hours per week that they're doing their face-to-face. -face. Uh, and it can be really good for their practice and self-paced learning. So they can do those um, on their own. Um, there are a range of documents that we've got. We've got a course attendance breach uh, warning letters uh, that are in there that go to an intervention plan form. So if you are a consult member, make sure that you get onto the Babacity documents and access these attendance documents. Uh, they've been written against the requirements of the National Code and they've got through um, all of our audits as compliant. So they've been working well. Okay, that's it for now. Any questions around Krakos Elikos? We've got a few people still online who I know don't, aren't Krakos. <laughs> <laughs> so you might be thinking about doing quite cost maybe. <laughs> so uh, very interesting. Um, you know, we can help you with Krikos. So if you wanted to add Krikos uh, to your scope, uh, we could definitely assist you with that um, addition uh, to your current business product that you have. Okay, next month is complaints and appeals. Um, and uh, this one is relevant for RTO and CRICOS, so we will be doing the two together. So we'll be reviewing the complaints and appeals process. It's also quality indicator reporting time. So we will be going through at the start of the month what you need to do in order to submit your quality indicator report by the end of the month. So we'll be helping, so I highly recommend you get onto that one because we'll be going through the process of what you need to do and what not only compliance requirements, but how is it going to help your RTO um, with that feedback that you've got within your RTO? And what are you going to do to improve your practices? That's it for now. See you next month. So next month, uh, 3 p.m. And it will be on the first Monday, which is the 7th, I think. 7th of June. So Monday, the 7th of June. Oh, it's on the top. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Kira fixed my PowerPoints for me. I forgot she put that on there. So uh, Monday the 7th, we've got that on there. So thank you very much for attending today. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Just another reminder, Mastermind, every Monday, 10.30 a.m. We've got some amazing results from our clients who are attending regularly. Uh, they are smashing it. Um, we had one of our clients actually state she sent me a message, not, not Krikos, RTO, sent me a message and said, um, we did our biggest month ever. We turned over $500,000. Is that good for an RTO? And I went, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's freaking awesome. 
Um, and not very many RTOs, particularly just the domestic market, will turn over 500,000 in one month. So if you want to get similar results, get along to the mastermind. And she accredits it to our job trainer training um, and also the coaching that we've been doing with her um, as part of the mastermind. So get onto the mastermind. That's where you'll see the results. Um, we have so many members who could benefit from attending the masterminds regularly. And we would love to see you there. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see you next Monday at 10.30 a.m. Um, if you haven't yet, schedule some time in your diary and we'd love to catch up with you there. All right, have a great week, month, and we'll catch up with you soon. Bye for now.